thank you for joining us today. Um, as always, you can feel free to drop any questions you have for us um, in the live chat. Um, and I will go ahead and ask Dr. Vuga on your behalf. Um, this is Dr. Vuga. He was my graphics professor this past semester and is an assistant professor of computer graphics at the UTCS department. Um, and he's just gonna be telling you a little bit about his work and everything that he does. Um, so take it away, Dr. Vuga. Awesome, well, thanks Art, for the introduction. And um, yeah, so I do computer graphics and it turns out computer graphics has many different aspects to it. And the kind of work that I do is especially in the area of physical simulation uh, and problems related to simulation. So I'll talk a bit about what that means uh, later on in the talk, but I thought I'd start just by showing an example of the kind of thing uh, that I do. So um, over here uh, is the aqueduct of Segovia. So this was built by the Romans. Uh, this is standing in the middle of a town uh, in Spain. It's been standing there for about 2000 years. Um, and you know this was done using ancient Roman uh, masonry techniques. It's just a bunch of stones kind of piled on top of each other. Uh, with some mortar in between to keep the thing stable. There's no steel or anything inside uh, the aqueduct. And uh, engineers uh, in the town of Segovia were getting a bit nervous about this thing. Um, you know, if there's an earthquake, how strong would this be? Uh, it's it's got to be pretty decently strong since it's been standing for 2,000 years, but still they wanted to kind of reassure themselves of uh, what it would take to make this thing topple down. And so uh, in the 1990s, they started doing an analysis of how stable this aqueduct really was. And um, you know, uh, there's computer techniques for doing this. Uh, there's a method called the finite element method. It's uh, you know one of, one of the most important algorithms for engineering that was ever invented. Uh, basically, it models uh, every brick inside of the aqueduct as a deformable solid and measures how much each brick will sag under the weight of all the bricks above, and tries to analyze. Okay, well, are there going to be cracks that form? Uh, uh, how how strong is this thing going to be under its own weight? What happens if you start adding in forces that um, uh, perturbs the structure and might make it fall down. And, um, you know, this is a, uh, you, you can tell this is old. This is a screenshot uh, on a CRT monitor and uh, the screenshot was taken with an actual camera. So this is a photograph of a CRT monitor showing the results of the simulation. And there's different colors here showing the stress inside this uh, aqueduct, uh, how much force is flowing through the different parts of one section of the aqueduct. And, um, they analyzed this thing and they concluded that the aqueduct was unstable. And um, it wasn't just unstable under an earthquake, it was unstable even as it stood with no other forces acting on the aqueduct. And this is obviously complete nonsense. There's no way that something can stand for 2000 years if it's not stable. Uh, something must have gone wrong in the analysis. And you know, if you think about why it was that these really powerful computer techniques for analyzing the stability of the aqueduct didn't work, uh, it really boils down to a mismatch between how the aqueduct was being modeled and what was really responsible for the stability of the thing. And you probably have intuition about this. If you play with Legos at home uh, and you build something and the thing falls down, uh, why does it fall down? It's probably not because uh, you built something that's so massive that the weight of the Legos causes the Legos at the bottom to deform and crumble and, and, and break apart. Uh, usually what happens is you make a tower and it leans over a little bit too much. And then the tower kind of hinges apart and falls down. The, uh, the same thing is true when you're making things out of masonry. Masonry is super strong under compression. You know, if you were to build a, a huge column a mile high, maybe that would be enough to make the, the bricks at the bottom collapse under their own weight. But typically masonry is so strong under compression that you can basically treat the, treat the blocks as perfectly rigid. It's not the blocks crumbling that causes uh, a building made out of masonry to fall. It's really a geometric problem. It's, it's that uh, the lean is too aggressive and the building falls down. And so to understand whether or not something like the aqueduct of Segovia is stable, really it's a question about the geometry. Really, uh, you should be able to look at the shape of the structure, look at how the bricks are fit into that shape, and that should tell you all you need to know about uh, whether or not this thing is stable and how stable it would be under, uh, you know, uh, natural disasters such as earthquakes. And this insight is, is, you know, this is a key reason why the Romans were able to build these kinds of huge structures that stood for thousands of years in the first place. It's not like they had computers, it's not like they're engineers, had uh, you know, worked out the equations for what, what, what kind of buildings were stable and what were not. 
you know, they had rules of thumb, but that they, that they uh, you know, they did some mathematics. They also had a lot of rules of thumb, uh, which they used uh, and which they discovered by trial and error. And one of the main techniques that they used to design their structures was to build scale models. Uh, you know, it's easy to bake lots of things that are small and see if it falls down or not. And then if they have something small that doesn't fall down, then they, you know, they decide, okay, well, this is a good design. Let me now make this big. And it turns out it doesn't fall down if it's big. And the reason for this is, again, because it's all geometric. Uh, this is not true for wood, for example. It, it's easy to make something out of wood that's stable, you know, if it's, uh, if, if it's made uh, at a small scale and then it breaks when it's at a large scale because this wood is not as strong as, uh, as masonry under compression. And uh, it doesn't have this uh, property that you can completely neglect the material properties uh, when you analyze the stability. But masonry is kind of special in that way. So, you know, the Romans took advantage of this geometric nature of stability. And, um, you know, this, uh, other architects throughout history have taken advantage of it too. Um, there's a theorem called the safe theorem, which architects have used to study whether designs of buildings like cathedrals are stable or not. And, uh, you know, I'll give you the basic idea of how the safe theorem works. So let's say you have, uh, you know, um, a masonry structure like an arch. Maybe this is the simplest thing you can make. Uh, you know, you just stack a bunch of blocks to make an arch. And you want to know, is this arch going to stand or not? Well, what you can do is you can pick an arbitrary point inside the masonry, like this point up here. And then you can start drawing what's called a line of thrust. It's basically tracing a line of force that's traveling through the masonry as it goes from this arbitrary point you've picked down to the ground. And if you do that for this arch, you'll get this dotted line that kind of flows downwards uh, into the ground here. And depending on what point you pick at the start, you're going to get different dotted curves. So, you know, if you pick a point that's too far down, maybe you get that the dotted line, uh, you know, leaves, uh, leaves the volume of the masonry before it hits the ground. And in order for this thing to be guaranteed to be stable, you have to find at least one of these curves, one of these lines of thrust that goes from your, uh, any point up top here down into the ground. If there exists such a line, that's a certificate that this arch is stable. And if you can't find a line, no matter which point you try, then, uh, then it's unstable. Now, how, how do architects take advantage of this? Well, you know, you, you can do this by trial and error. Maybe you have a good guess of a good po starting point, and then you trace this line through the masonry and you check that it stays inside uh, at all points uh, on its path to the ground. And you can scale the same idea up uh, if you have a cathedral. So, you know, here you have a plan for a cathedral and um, you can see that an architect has done exactly this thrust analysis on the design of the cathedral. And you can also see the shows why the flying buttresses are necessary if you want to make a cathedral uh, that, that, that reaches so high up into the air. Uh, the walls alone of the cathedral um, are too thin. If you try to draw one of these lines of thrust, um, it'll immediately leave through the walls, through the side of the walls of the cathedral, unless the walls are super thick, like impracticably thick. And, uh, you know, the flying buttresses give a path for these curves to flow through. So the curve flows through the flying buttress and down into the ground. And the existence of this curve, again, guarantees stability uh, of this masonry. So this safe theorem is useful for analyzing if something is stable, uh, but you can also kind of turn it around. You can turn the same, same theorem into a tool for designing stable masonry. So, uh, you know, instead of guessing a, a structure made out of stone and then analyzing whether or not it's stable, we can start with the curve. We can start with a curve and say, okay, if this curve satisfies the safe theorem, I know that as long as I build masonry around the curve, so it contains the curve, then I can turn a skeleton into a full masonry structure, which is going to be guaranteed stable by the safe theorem. And this trick was used uh, by a famous architect, uh, Gaudi. Um, he uh, built uh, probably most famously uh, the cathedral in Barcelona. And the way he built the cathedral, the way he designed it is super clever. Um, so here's a photograph. This is a photograph of um, uh, a museum exhibit that's in the Gaudi Museum in Barcelona. And what you're seeing here is you're seeing a bunch of sandbags. So these brown things over here are sandbags. Uh, and there's a net that's hanging from the ceiling. 
So you're seeing, uh, you know, uh, uh, a net and the sandbags are pulling down on the net and, and making the net take a certain shape uh, as it hangs from the ceiling. And what Gaudi would do is he would play around with the sandbags, move the weight from, uh, from point to point to make a shape that he liked um, uh, in this hanging net. And then he would take this net and he would sketch it and he would turn the net upside down and the shape that the net made when it was hanging from the ceiling, if you were now to turn this into a skeleton for a masonry structure, that masonry structure is guaranteed to be stable. Uh, and I'm not gonna go through the math for why this is, but the basic intuition here is that if you have a bunch of nets that are stable under gravity being pulled by the sandbags, the, the math for this being stable is the same as the math for a bunch of uh, beams that are under compression where gravity is now pushing down instead of pulling down on the nets. So any design he could make with these nets could be turned into a design for the cathedral. And well, you know, he did all this by hand. He actually hung the nets up from the ceiling and moved the weights around by hand. But a very natural idea now that we have access to computers is to try to turn this into an algorithm to, to automatically find uh, stable structures by uh, optimizing for the shape of these nets if you were to move around the weights and turn this into design tools for making stable masonry structures. Now, how is this useful? Uh, well, here's a sketch of, uh, uh, here's one of Frank Gehry's buildings. Uh, I'm not exactly sure which one this is. Uh, he has got a bunch of them, like the MIT computer science building was designed by him, for example. I think this one might be in Sydney somewhere. I'm not sure. Uh, this, I, I forget which one this is. But uh, apparently this over here on the left uh, is the actual sketch uh, that Frank Gehry made of the building that later turned into this uh, structure over here. Uh, now, you know, I'm no architect. I haven't taken classes in architectural drawing. So maybe if I took enough classes, I'd be able to look at this thing here and see this uh, in my mind. Um, but unsurprisingly, you can't give this to an engineer and have them be at all happy uh, with this uh, uh, as something that they can analyze for whether it's stable or not. So any kind of uh, actual construction project is gonna involve a bunch of iteration uh, between the architect who has a vision uh, for uh, what he or she wants to do and the engineer who has to make sure that the thing can actually be built uh, and be built safely. And uh, the architect is gonna have some pie in the sky idea for what to do. The engineer is gonna be like, this is impossible. You've got to put in some big pillars over here. You've got to get rid of some of this stuff over there. And eventually, you know, they converge on some design uh, that it can be safely built. Um, but uh, what's missing really is a tool that can give the architect some intuition about whether what they're imagining is at all plausible, uh, is at all close to being something that could be realized uh, by an engineer. And that's where some of these design tools can really be helpful. So, you know, if you had a design tool that could take in some initial uh, sketch uh, of a building and could tell the architect, look, uh, this is not going to be stable, uh, but there's some small modifications that you can make uh, in order to make this thing more likely to be stable. And the architect can iteratively uh, interact with this tool and kind of sculpt the building into the shape that they have uh, envisioned uh, in their mind. Um, they'll then end up with something that the engineer won't have to make as many changes to uh, before the thing can actually be built. And so this is the motivation for these kinds of design tools that can be used by architects for making masonry structures. And you know, I really want to stress here that I'm not suggesting replacing the engineer, uh, not in the, in the least. It's really important that a really careful analysis is done at the end of the day uh, between design and actual construction to really make sure that this thing is going to be stable, uh, just, you know, not only just be stable under gravity, but it's also going to be, you know, is, is going to, going to be uh, not fall down and under severe weather, is going to be resistant to earthquakes, uh, you know, is, 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 uh, is going to be safe in case of a fire and so on and so forth. All of this requires a very detailed analysis uh, that's done um, and that can't be replaced just with a computer graphics algorithm. But having this algorithm in the design loop and uh, letting it give an idea to the architect of what is in the realm of possibility or not uh, is still super valuable uh, before the design gets handed off to the engineers. So we coded this up, uh, me and some collaborators, um, and we made several, you know, uh, we made several example structures using this tool. Uh, here's one example of a structure we made. Um, I call this the Swiss cheese example because it's got a whole bunch of holes punched into it. 
And um, even though it's uh, filled with holes, we can still guarantee mathematically that this thing is going to be stable if you're actually to build it out of bricks. And uh, if you look at the front of the, of the structure here, you can see that I visualized these curves, uh, these networks of thrust lines, uh, lines of force passing through the building, which guarantee that this thing is going to be stable. And the existence of this uh, net inside the structure uh, certifies the stability of the thing. So, um, you know, I did this on the computer. I made this structure. I never actually built it uh, in real life. I, I, tried, I, I was going to for a while. I was thinking about 3D printing a bunch of bricks uh, that I could then assemble into this thing. But it's a bit uh, more annoying than it sounds at first. You have to build some scaffolding, some formwork that you can lay the pieces on top of uh, while you're building. And I never got around to doing that, although some follow-up work did have some really cool demos of actual structures they've built. Um, but you know, the fact that I never built this, this might make you wonder, well, does this work at all? Is this actually a practical algorithm uh, for constructing masonry? So I want to uh, you know, end this part of the talk about masonry uh, with this example here. So this is the Collier Memorial. Um, this is uh, built, this is currently on MIT's campus. Um, this was built uh, several years ago uh, following the marathon bombing. Um, so, uh, you know, there were some terrorists that attacked the Boston Marathon and then they were trying to get away and they were running through MIT's campus. And one of the campus police officers was, uh, you know, um, trying to stop them and he was shot uh, in the process. And so MIT wanted to erect a, a memorial to the heroism of, of this cop. And um, one of the architects, uh, um, uh, John Oxendorf, that I was collaborating with was put in charge of this project from the architectural perspective. And he wanted to design this thing. He wanted to make sure that this was going to be built out of pure stone. And depending on how much you know about you know, modern construction, uh, you may know that most modern buildings are not made out of pure stone. Uh, usually you have concrete and you also have steel rebar inside of the concrete. Uh, and the reason for this is that the steel actually adds a bunch of tensile strength to the concrete. So concrete is the same as stone. It's extremely strong under compression but it's very weak under tension. And uh, steel is the opposite. Steel is very strong under tension. So if you put steel rebar inside of concrete, then you get um, a material that's strong under both kinds of loads, uh, which makes it really practical as a construction material. But there is a downside. Um, you know, as you can see with uh, Roman ruins, if you make something out of pure stone, it's gonna last a while. It's gonna last thousands of years uh, absent a, a natural disaster or you know, a wartime accident that causes explosions to tear apart the building or, or what have you. Uh, it's going to last basically forever. And the same is not true for skyscrapers or other buildings made out of uh, reinforced concrete. Um, if you look at any skyscraper that's built today, the shelf life of the skyscraper is going to be about 100 years. Um, no matter how you know, you know, people try to lower the pH of the, the concrete, they try to really seal it off to, to keep the moisture out of the concrete, but no matter what you do, weathering is eventually going to cause uh, you know water to work its way into the concrete and to corrode the steel, and the steel is eventually going to lose its uh, structural strength because of corrosion. So, if you build something out of steel reinforced concrete, it'll last a hundred years. If it's made of pure stone, it'll last thousands of years, if not indefinitely. And so, you know, if you want to, if you're going to make a memorial, uh, it makes sense to really make this thing last uh, as long as possible. Uh, the only problem is that this violates engineering code, which requires there to be you know, steel reinforcement if you're re going to make a, a structure like this. So uh, you know, the architect and the engineers were duking back and forth over uh, whether to include steel reinforcement inside this structure. Uh, and to really convince himself that it was going to be OK to use old Roman building practices rather than modern engineering for making this thing, uh, John Oxendorf, he he used a whole bunch of different algorithms, a bunch of different software to check, including the one that we developed uh, to check that this thing was actually going to be stable. And all of them returned that this thing was going to be OK. Uh, so the engineers did eventually, uh, you know, with reluctance, build this thing. Uh, there's one, one steel peg somewhere inside this thing that they insisted on. So it's not completely free of steel. But uh, for the most part, this thing is standing only under the weight of the blocks alone. Uh, but the president of MIT called up John Oxendorf and said, uh, if this thing ever falls down, you're fired. Um, and you know, there's been several Boston winters since then. There's been six feet of snow that piled up on top of this thing, and the thing is still standing. So so far, so good. 
So these algorithms, uh, they work. Uh, the, the geometric understanding behind uh, stability um, uh, is powerful. It'll actually let you make real world things uh, if you understand it and can turn it into an algorithm. Uh, one last thing I want to mention is that these same algorithms that can be used to design uh, stone structures can also be used for steel and glass. So usually you think of glass as being super weak. You know, you think of a baseball flying through a window and breaking the window. Uh, but this is only really true for thin panes of glass. And it's only really true, uh, you know, if you, uh, uh, you know, throw a baseball perpendicular to the pane of glass. If you have a thick enough piece of glass, it's super strong under compression, basically as strong as concrete. Uh, you know, that's why at the zoo, for example, you have alligators inside of glass cages and it's totally safe because, uh, you know, glass of sufficient uh, size is super strong. And so there's been a push more and more towards um, making structures out of steel and glass uh, for aesthetic reasons. Um, you know, nowadays, uh, you know, the enthusiasm for these kinds of buildings has kind of decreased uh, because even though it's great in terms of letting light into the building and in terms of the aesthetics of the building, it's not so great in terms of cooling and global warming. Um, so, uh, you know, depending on what the climate is where you're building these things, uh, maybe you don't want to make a structure that has so much glass in it. Um, but if you do want to design something made out of steel and glass, the same mathematics will work. And the algorithms we came up with, with for masonry will work for these kinds of structures as well. So uh, that's a bit of an intro to the kind of things that I look at. You might be wondering, what's the computer graphics angle? What do these masonry structures have to do with computer graphics? Because probably when you think of computer graphics, you think more something like this. Uh, um, you know, this is Toy Story. Uh, it's not the first instance of computer graphics in movies, uh, but it is the first movie that was made using computer graphics 100%. It was all done uh, using computer graphics effects from start to finish. And it was revolutionary. And there's a lot of tricks in Toy Story that made it work as well as it did. Uh, for example, it's a movie about toys. Oh, well, for one thing, this is great in terms of merchandising, but there's also a technical reason why it was really smart to make the first computer graphics movie uh, about toys. And that's because toys are supposed to look like plastic. Uh, that's kind of the point, that's a feature. Uh, and back then, in, uh, uh, when Toy Story came out, uh, we were really bad at making good looking skin. Uh, even, you know, even as recently as a few years ago, human skin still looked pretty bad uh, in computer animated special effects. Uh, and, um, you know, especially back in Toy Story's day, all skin that you tried to render looked like plastic. So having humans in the movie is a bad idea. They would look terrible and people would, it would wreck their suspension of disbelief. They would fall into this uncanny valley of eeriness and be like, oh man, no, this, this person looks terrible. But if a toy looks like plastic, oh, that's great. It looks like the toy. Um, so you, you, you know, if you go back and watch Toy Story, you'll notice that there are a few frames when you kind of see Andy's face when he's playing with the toys, maybe at the beginning of the movie. They really go out of their way to show as few humans as possible in the movie and really put the center of attention on the toys. Um, but still, this, this movie was a triumph of computer graphics. It really uh, you know, changed the scene for how computer graphics was used in movies for decades to come. And the part of computer graphics that this really exercised was something called rendering. Uh, and rendering is all about how to make objects look real. Um, uh, how do you make realistic looking plastic, real, it looks realistic looking cloth? How do you take 3D data and make a 2D image that represents uh, a realistic uh, rendition of that 3D data. But that's not all that uh, computer graphics is about. Uh, the part that I work on is more towards the side of simulation. Uh, and if rendering is about making things look real, simulation is about making things act real. Um, so uh, for example, this is The Hobbit. Uh, the, uh, I never saw much of this movie. Uh, the Lord of the Rings were excellent. I, I was not as enthused about The Hobbit. Uh, but The Hobbit did use uh, uh, some of the research I worked on. Um, so some of the hair and the characters, like there's a, a wizard in this movie that has a beard. And this beard is made with special effects. And it used some of uh, my, uh, the work that I did when I was a PhD student. Uh, same thing with some of the fur in the animals in this movie. And um, if you want to make this movie and you want to make these special effects look real, it's not enough just to make each individual frame look real. You want the actual physics. You want the motion to look realistic. And physical simulation is all about how to take the laws of physics uh, that govern these materials like the hair in this movie 
uh, in real life and map them on to realistic looking virtual hair that you can then composite uh, in the movie itself. So I've worked on things like hair, I've worked on things like cloth. So this is uh, Tangled. This is uh, uh, the Rapunzel movie that Disney made a, uh, a few years ago. Uh, I did not work on the hair for this movie. They actually used a competitor's algorithm for the hair in this movie. Uh, but they did uh, use some of my research on cloth. Uh, so the cloth in this movie um, used, uh, you know, uh, some of the physics algorithms uh, uh, that I worked on. Uh, and that has been worked into Disney's pipeline for several more recent movies as well. So that's the kind of stuff I do. I try to understand physics and turn it into algorithms that can be used for things like movie special effects or design tools like the masonry project I talked about at the beginning. And um, the main challenge here is that the real world is super detailed. The, uh, you know, there's no way that you can simulate realistically a real world object at infinite levels of detail. You can't simulate the quantum mechanics of any uh, object at the scale uh, of everyday experience. Uh, you have to make approximations. Um, even really detailed looking objects that you see in movies or games, they're made up of triangles, you know, and the number of triangles keeps going up. Like maybe nowadays a human character would have a million triangles uh, uh, in the model that's used to render the, the character. And that lets you get a certain level of detail, but that's not nearly the level of detail you need in order to be able to model hair at the level of the individual, like, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, hair fibers or, or to model cloth at the individual cloth fiber levels. You have to somehow take the physics and make approximations, figure out how to make algorithms that are discrete, that can use a, a finite amount of memory and a finite amount of computation, but still look realistic, still get the essence of the physics right. And that's where most of my research comes in, is in this translation step of taking uh, real world physics and coming up with algorithms that can uh, keep the essential physics while throwing away any of the details that don't actually matter for making the behavior um, uh, look realistic and match uh, qualitatively to the behavior that you want. So let me give a bit of an explanation uh, of what I mean by this. Let's start with a really simple physical system, uh, a planet going around the sun. So from high school, maybe you remember that if a planet goes around the sun, it's supposed to go in an ellipse. And the focus of the ellipse should be uh, uh, the sun. And you know, the sun is accelerating the planet. It's uh, pulling on the planet as it goes around in the ellipse. And now let's say we want to simulate this thing. How are we going to do this? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to cut up time into a bunch of windows uh, called time steps. And we're not going to calculate the exact motion of the planet. You know, for one planet, it turns out the motion simple enough. We could actually just write down a formula for that motion. But that doesn't scale even to like three planets. There's no closed form formula for the motion uh, uh, of the planets. So um, we're not going to do that. We're instead going to use a more general approach which says, okay, well, I've got my planet here at the start of my simulation. And now, for example, I'm gonna simulate, okay, well, where's the planet gonna be in a day? And where's it gonna be in two days and in three days and in four days? And that's gonna trace out a chunky motion, a discrete motion of the planet as it orbits around the sun. And I can take bigger steps or smaller steps. If I have access to more computational power, I could say, okay, well, I'm gonna take smaller steps and that's gonna give me a more accurate trajectory. So maybe I'd have a slightly less chunky trajectory, but I'm never gonna get something infinitely smooth. I'm never going to uh, get a perfect uh, rendition of the orbit. So it's kind of a hopeless cause to try to ask for perfect smoothness of the orbit. But even if I resign myself to a chunky orbit, I can still ask for the orbit to be good. And what do I mean by this? Well, if I just stare at this orbit here, there's obvious problems with this. There's obvious mismatches other than the fact that the orbit is chunky between the path that you see in the dotted ellipse here and the path that you see in the, in the yellow curve. And for example, one thing that seems to be happening here is that the yellow is spiraling out. And that's not supposed to happen. The planet should be going around in a stable orbit. And um, well, that's not happening in the discrete case. So that's one property that you could insist on. It's okay if it's chunky, but it should be stable. It should close up, or at least it should, you know, keep going around approximating an ellipse without ever spiraling out into, into the emptiness of space or spiraling in and crashing into the sun. So that's one property we want. There's other properties you might want too. 
that you might remember from uh, you know high school physics, conservation laws like conservation of energy, conservation of momentum, conservation of angular momentum. We know these are things that have to be true about the smooth motion. And so we can ask, let's make sure that these are also true about the yellow motion. And you know, if you, if you keep thinking back, maybe you remember some other properties too, like Kepler's laws. Uh, Kepler's second law, oops, Kepler's second law, for example, uh, says that you know, if it takes a day for the planet to go from one point here to another point here, and then a day to go from here to here, then these two blue regions that are swept out in equal amounts of time, they're swept out each in one day, those have to have equal areas. What this is saying is, uh, you know, the closer the planet gets to the sun, the faster it moves. That's what would make this, uh, you know, triangular wedge down here at the same area as this, uh, you know, uh, taller but squatter triangular wedge over there. And um, Kepler's second law says that these two things are equal. And what's interesting here is that even though it's named after Kepler, uh, based on Kepler, it's based on Kepler's, uh, you know, empirical observations of the motions of the planets, Kepler is not the one who wrote down the mathematical proof of this law. Uh, it turns out this proof was uh, found in Newt by, by Newton and written up in his Principia. This is the actual diagram Newton used uh, for proving this, uh, this uh, law. Uh, and, you know, we can look at a simplified version of Newton's proof. And what's really interesting here is that Newton had a discrete argument. He didn't argue in terms of the exact motion of the planet. He argued again in terms of discrete motion, just like we do in modern times when we look at simulations. So imagine there's a sun over here, uh, down here at this point here. Imagine the planet's over here, and imagine the planet has some velocity uh, going from the bottom corner of the green triangle towards the top corner. And let's say we take one step. So, well, the planet's gonna move in a straight line, so the planet's gonna go from the corner down here, at position QI, to the point up here, position QI plus one. And now if you take a second step, if there were no sun, the planet would just keep moving again in a straight line. So the planet will move again from this point here, QI plus one, again in a, uh, in a straight line and end up up here. But it's not true that there's no sun. There is a sun. And the sun accelerates the planet. The sun changes the planet's velocity. So during the second step, the planet's not going to keep going straight. There's going to be a component that goes straight. There's also going to be a component that moves towards the sun. So you know the, uh, the velocity is going to have a component added in the direction of this line here from the sun to qi plus one. And that's going to make it so that um, in the second step, the planet moves up to the top of the blue triangle here. And Kepler's second law says that if it's true, it would say that these two triangles are equal. And it turns out you can actually show, this is like a high school geometry problem, that the green triangle and the blue triangle have the same areas. Uh, you know, how do you see this? Well, you can imagine looking at a triangle that goes from this point here to QI plus one to this point up here uh, that you would get if you just moved in a straight line and show that this triangle uh, has the same area as the green triangle. And this is true because the two triangles, this triangle and the green triangle have the same base and the same height, so they have the same area. And then to get the blue triangle, we're taking this uh, imaginary triangle uh, and shearing it. Uh, we're changing, we're not changing the base and we're not changing the height, but we're just shearing the top point and that's not going to change the area. So uh, the area of the green and the blue triangle is going to be the same after we do both these operations, this reflection and the shear. So that tells us that Kepler's second law is satisfied for this chunky motion. And now what did Newton do? Well, he invented calculus. Uh, so he used the ideas of calculus to turn this into a proof about the smooth motion. He took limits. Okay, well, let's take a step that's smaller and smaller and smaller. And these, uh, you know, discrete triangles are going to become infinitesimal areas. And that's going to prove Kepler's second law on the limit. But even if we don't take limits, this proof of Newton is still super interesting because it tells us a way of simulating the motion of the planet that is guaranteed by construction to satisfy Kepler's second law. So we can take this diagram and turn it into a, a, an algorithm to calculate the new position. We take the old position and we add the time step times the velocity. Uh, you know, the distance, uh, or the velocity times the time is going to give the distance we should travel in one step. And we, that will give us the new position. And then we'll also update the velocity by taking the old velocity and adding in the acceleration, the force due to gravity, 
uh, divided by the mass using f equals ma, uh, and use that to update uh, the velocity. And this algorithm is super simple. It's easy to code up. And if I run this algorithm, it's going to obey Kepler's second law. The areas uh, swept out in equal times by this algorithm will be equal by construction. And so um, that means that, in addition, the planet's not going to spiral out. It's going to have a steady orbit. It's going to violate, it's not going to violate conservation momentum, because uh, doing so would also violate Kepler's second law. And I'm going to get a motion uh, that um, is qualitatively correct. Uh, it's still going to be chunky, but it's going to match. And it's going to satisfy all these important invariants, these important properties of the smooth motion, uh, even though the motion is discrete. And this algorithm uh, has been used. Uh, there was a famous study I remember reading about about 10 years ago uh, where some scientists wanted to know what's the probability that the solar system is unstable. If we were to wait a billion years, what's the chance that the Earth's orbit destabilizes and the Earth slams into Jupiter? Uh, and it turns out the chance is pretty high. Some, uh, you know, something like 2%, some single digit percent chance that actually the solar system will become unstable uh, and uh, the orbit of the Earth will go crazy and, and slam into Jupiter. You know, I, I wouldn't stay up at night about this. We're gonna have lots of other problems in a billion years too. Uh, but these algorithms, uh, even though they're making approximations, they're still reliable enough that you can predict things a billion years in the future because they've been designed to preserve these important invariants uh, that uh, um, are predictive about the motion of the physical system. So that's really the heart of what I do. I look at physics. I try to understand what are the important geometric structures in the physical problem, uh, you know, like the lines of thrust, the safe theorem that determines the stability of the masonry structures, and then turn this into better algorithms for doing uh, either straight up simulation for things like movie special effects or design uh, algorithms uh, for things like the masonry I showed at the beginning of the talk. Now, you know, I want to point out that when you're doing physical simulation, there's um, trade-offs you have to make. There's not one best way of doing physical simulation. There's this knob you can tune that tunes between speed and correctness. Um, you know, at one extreme, you have the physics you would find in games. It's so like if you have angry birds and you want some bird that smacks into some structure and causes some destruction of some bricks, you don't actually care. You don't actually care that these logs are toppling in a perfectly physically realistic way. In fact, if these things are unrealistic and kind of explode in more energetic way than they should, that's kind of more a feature than a bug when you have uh, a game. But one thing you really do care about in a game is that it's fast. Uh, you know, this Angry Birds have gone a lot less viral if you had to wait 20 minutes between when you launch the bird and when you see the result in order to crank away at a super accurate physical simulation of what would happen if you had like a house made out of uh, logs that, uh, you know, a, a, a mass smacked into and toppled. So for a game, you really want to be way over on the speed side of things and you'll make any sacrifices necessary in order to get speed even if correctness is, uh, you know, uh, noticeably unrealistic. Um, more towards the middle, you have the special effects in movies. So here's Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, this is a scene in Guardians of the Galaxy where a spaceship crashes and explodes. So you saw this nice fireball when the two spaceships crashed into each other. And of course, this fireball was done using special effects. And it's not physically realistic. Uh, there's no oxygen in space. It's not like you can have fireballs in space if things collide. Uh, but of course, as an audience, we like to see big explosions. So we want to see this in a movie. But here, we need more accuracy. Um, if you go and watch 90s TV shows, uh, you know, like Star Trek or Babylon 5, uh, the, the special effects there are bad enough that they're really jarring to the modern eye. You look at fire and it look more like glowing plastic than actual flames. Uh, whereas in uh, modern movies, you know, I can go to a, a AAA movie uh, and I can see an explosion and I might not be able to tell, uh, oh, is this special effects or is this practical effects? Is this a real explosion going off? Because nowadays the algorithms have gotten so good at making real looking flames and real looking explosions. Um, and of course, there's a cost to this. This is not going to run in real time. Uh, if you're making special effects for a movie, um, you know, you have a cluster of machines dedicated to rendering uh, the movie clip that has the special effects in it. Uh, 
And if it takes a night, oh, if it takes overnight to actually uh, do the computation and make that clip, uh, uh, that's okay. The director will give some feedback. Uh, you know, you'll 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 redo the scene. You'll change the parameters of the simulation. You'll put in some more artistic control. Uh, you'll rerun the simulation. The director will come back and complain angrily the next day about how it's all wrong. Uh, but it's okay to have this kind of slower design loop when you're making physics for movies. So here you're kind of towards the middle. And then there's certain set, there's certain cases where you really want to be all the way over on the right of the knob uh, in full correctness. Uh, you know, if you're doing drug discovery or if you do, if you're Boeing trying to you know predict uh, you know what's the reliability of these uh, you know this new design in our airplane, how aerodynamic is it? Here you really want guarantees of correctness. It's unacceptable to have any kind of uh, hacks inside of your simulation. And for the, when the knob is all the way over here on the right, you really pay uh, in terms of performance. So those kinds of simulations you do in scientific computing, uh, these are things you have to run the supercomputing cluster. Um, in fact, I had a student, a friend of mine who was a postdoc who was working on fish swimming, and he wanted to study how fish escape predators. He had some hypotheses about how the fish could curl up into a sea and then quickly uh, elongate their bodies and shoot off a vortex to let the fish escape super fast from predators. And he wanted to check whether um, this was actually optimal, whether evolution had found the optimal strategy for escape from predators. And so he ran a simulation and this thing ran for years. Uh, I think it was three years between when he started the simulation when he finally got his results. And I was teasing him during the office, like, you know, uh, what if there's a bug in your simulation? What if you wait three years and you get complete nonsense uh, out of the simulation at the end of the day? And, you know, he, he kind of poo-pooed uh, my concerns. He's like, oh, well, you know, I'm checking the intermediate results. They seem reasonable. Uh, okay, fine. Uh, you know, you can do these kinds of things, check intermediate results. But still, um, you know, if you really want accurate simulation, if you really care about getting all of the effects fully correct, uh, then you have to pay in performance. Uh, and the kinds of algorithms you have to run if you're willing to wait three years for results are totally different than the algorithms you run if you want uh, to make angry birds. And so, this also comes in into the research that I do, is picking the right level of detail uh, where we want to model the physics. That's going to affect uh, what kind of algorithms we use um, for even doing the same uh, phenomena. So I'm not going to talk in a lot of detail about other stuff I've done, but I want to kind of give you a taste for the other kinds of projects that I've worked on. Uh, I've simulated all kinds of stuff. I've simulated uh, cloth uh, hair, like I've mentioned before. Uh, I've simulated uh, more exotic kinds of behaviors like a uh, melting and swelling of plastics, um, curling up of things like when you watercolor paper and the paper curls up, um, contact, uh, collisions. Collisions are actually probably the hardest thing in physical simulation, probably the thing that's the most unsolved. Uh, and you know this, if you play video games, especially if you play video games with kind of a buggy physics engine like a Bethesda game, you know, you've seen objects fall through the floor, or, you know, my favorite thing is uh, you kill a bad guy and, and uh, the bad guy is, uh, you know, on the floor. Uh, then you wait a few minutes and you come back to that part of the level. And then the bad guy's like jittering on the ground and, uh, you know, uh, objects are kicked up into the air. Um, uh, uh, even though the, 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 it's supposed to be a, you know, a static uh, corpse that's been sitting there for, for um, hours. And the reason this happens is there's been a failure in the physics engine. The collisions have failed. And it's injected a whole bunch of energy into the simulation and caused the explosions of the ragdoll physics engine. Collisions are super hard, uh, and I've worked a bit on that. And then I've worked on other kinds of design problems. So I worked on the masonry. Um, I've also worked on deployable structures. So, uh, you know, if you're NASA and you want to send uh, components for a space station up into space, uh, um, you have to, uh, you, you want to uh, basically fold up these structural elements into something really compact for launching up on a space shuttle. And then you want to be able to deploy this into a, a large structure once you're up in space. And I've looked a bit at how to use origami and design origami that can uh, deploy uh, and collapse uh, in controllable ways, even if you have complicated shapes, complicated curvature in your structure. I've been super interested in growth and problems related to growth, uh, which I might talk about in a bit. Uh, and also uh, really recently I've been looking at weaves and how you can weave different shaped objects uh, out of uh, ribbons um, uh, using uh, traxial weaves and other kinds of uh, woven uh, patterns. So, you know, I talked a, a bit about how hair was used in, in The Hobbit. Um, and you usually think of hair as really easy because it's 1D. How much simpler can you get? It's just a curve. 
Um, but actually the physics of hair is quite complicated by the fact that hair can, uh, has a resistance to twist. Uh, and so the physics of hair uh, really is all about the coupling between the twisting and the bending of hair. And you see this in cables of all different scales, you know, from the double helix inside your DNA all the way to like massive undersea cables uh, that are laid by boats uh, between uh, you know, Europe and the United States. Uh, you even have interesting physics happening, you know, uh, in phone cords. Uh, you know, maybe some of you recognize this. If you go back to your parents' house, maybe they still have a landline. I don't even have a landline. Uh, but your parents may still have a landline with an actual like headset that's attached uh, to the phone. And you get these, uh, you know, it's really easy to introduce these things called helical perversions uh, into um, the headset. If you've played around with the slinky, it's really easy to introduce these, uh, these things into the slinky and really annoying to get rid of them. You basically have to work these things all the way to the end to the receiver uh, if you want to get rid of these helical perversions. And this also is caused by the interplay of the bending and the twist uh, of the rod. And that's basically what we have to simulate when we want to make hair look realistic. Uh, we need to simulate the fact that when you twist up a piece of hair, it causes these complicated bending phenomena, um, like the formation of first a spiral if you twist a little bit, and then formation of a plectoneme, uh, these kinds of knots where the hair is like coiled in on itself if you curl, coil it uh, long enough. Um, and this coupling of bending and twist is what gives curly hair its shape and gives its uh, dynamics, its motion. Uh, when you have uh, you know, someone with long curly hair uh, shaking their head, if you want that to look good, you have to get the right uh, coupling of bending and twist. And we worked out the physics of this. And um, if you want to make an animation of a full scalp of hair, you basically then just have to scale this up uh, to hundreds of thousands of hairs. So um, you know, this is a video. This is a video from What a Digital, um, the uh, uh, special effects company in charge of uh, Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. This was a uh, tech demo that they did as a proof of concept to see that the hair physics was actually going to work when you scaled it up. I'm probably not supposed to show this uh, this clip, um, but but it, here it is anyway. Um, and um, you can see that uh, you know uh, the physics governing each hair is the same as the uh, uh, physics uh, that I showed for a single strand of hair. It's just now scaled up massively to to many uh, strands of hair. And oh, uh, if you scale it up like this, you end up getting hair that it looks realistic if you. Uh, um, if you violently shake your head. Um, it turns out that the physics for hair is this, uh, can be modified pretty easily to the physics for uh, fluids that have um, string-like geometry, like a honey coming out of a conveyor belt. So we looked a bit at this too. So this is not a simulation. This is a real experiment. Uh, there are physicists uh, in uh, Canada who um, squeezed a bottle uh, of honey-like fluid onto a conveyor belt and looked at the pattern that it made uh, when uh, the honey hit the conveyor belt. And this is happening too slowly to really notice, but this conveyor belt slowing down over time. And as it slows down, the pattern that the honey makes on the conveyor belt is changing. So you notice it was kind of zigzagging back and forth at first, and now it's coiling back and forth in a figure eight. And as this conveyor belt keeps slowing down, eventually it's going to start changing too, and it's going to start uh, coiling just in one direction. So now it's doing some chaotic motion. Uh, you know, it's going through a transition period between the figure eight uh, and coiling just in one direction like it's doing now. And we wanted to be able to simulate this. Um, and so we did. We modified the physics to let this work uh, also for fluids. And here's our version of the conveyor belts. Um, and here uh, you can see that as this conveyor belt slows down, there's also a transition here between these different phases of zigzagging back and forth and uh, coiling um, and doing figure eights. And um, we can make phase diagrams. So we can look at, you know, for different speeds of conveyor belt, what did they get in the real experiment? And what do we get in our simulation? And you can see, you know, there's differences here. Like, you know, uh, you know um, this seems to make perfect circles. And um, here it seems kind of more elliptical, the shapes that we get. But uh, the kinds of patterns that we're getting, there's a good agreement in the phase diagram between the patterns that we get in our simulation and what we get in, uh, in the real world. And uh, you know the same kind of thing lets you do these kinds of uh, simulations really fast. So this is real time, uh, this simulation here. 
Uh, and you can do this kind of simulation of, you know, like goop dripping off of a monster, or in this case, a raspberry sauce dripping off of a, a chocolate bunny uh, in real time. Um, uh, and this fluid here is using the physics of, of curves in order to, to make this fast. Um, and as long as you don't have that, the fluid pools into too much uh, of, a, uh, of a volume, then uh, this will still look OK uh, and run super fast. So this is one example of being able to take the knob and tune it over towards efficiency if you need to uh, without sacrificing too much correctness. Um, let's see, I'm, I'm a biggest short of time here. Uh, I guess, uh, you know, the natural thing after 1D is to look at 2D things, 2D things like cloth um, uh, or, you know, other kinds of surface-like geometries. Uh, and the history behind the physics of cloth is super interesting. Uh, it goes back to um, the Royal Society in England. Uh, in the Royal Society, um, uh, Robert Hooke, uh, maybe you know him from Hooke's Law. Uh, he did that and a bunch of other stuff. Um, he was the chief experimenter of the Royal Society. And that meant that on Friday, his job was to go in front of the Royal Society and show the Royal Society a new piece of physics that had never been studied before. And you know, back then, uh, that was a much easier task than today uh, because so much was undiscovered back then. And one of the experiments he showed off was this uh, experiment of um, rubbing a violin bow against a metal plate. So um, if you take a metal plate and you sprinkle sand on top, so this uh, stuff uh, over here is sand, and then you rub your violin bow back and forth on the plate, uh, you'll see that the sand rearranges itself into this really beautiful symmetric pattern. And why does this happen? Well, uh, Hook didn't know. Uh, but there's a, a guy called Cladney who was really fascinated by this experiment and did a systematic version of this experiment. He noticed that if you change the frequency at which you rub the side of the plate, you get different patterns. And he made a diagrams of what patterns you would get depending on how fast you would rub the violin bow on the plate. And this is the kind of diagram that he made. And you can see there's lots of patterns here. There's lots of symmetries here. There's lots of cases where you can make new patterns by combining old patterns, like this one, superimpose on top of this one, make this one. And the lines here are where the sand would be, right? So you should imagine that uh, you know, there's sand along each of these black uh, curves that you're seeing in each of these patterns. But even though he was able to make a systematic diagram of all the possible patterns, he didn't have a rule that explained why these patterns arose. And um, you know, this study caught the attention of Emperor Napoleon himself. A little known fact is that Napoleon was actually a, an amateur mathematician uh, who was quite interested in math and physics. And um, he was so intrigued by these patterns and this experiment that he offered a prize of one kilogram of gold to anybody who could figure out the physics behind the patterns in these cladden plates. And um, the person who eventually uh, was able to yeah, OK, yeah, I'll have that in a few minutes. That's fine. Um, the person who was able to solve this uh, was Sophie Germain. Uh, she was a mathematician who studied this problem and actually took her three attempts to solve this. Um, and her main observation was that, well, where is the sand settling? It's, sanding, it's settling in the place of the plate is not vibrating. Um, and so if you could understand the vibration modes of the plate and understand where the lines of zero vibration are in the plate, this would tell you where the sand settles. And um, she did some simple arguments based on the geometry of vibrations of a plate in order to come up with a simple formula for the energy of a plate. Um, and it took her three tries. First try was just completely wrong. Uh, second try was, uh, you know, she relied on a formula by Euler that Euler sent her that was actually buggy. And so that kind of torpedoed the whole attempt. Uh, but her last attempt was correct. Um, and I'm not going to explain this formula. I, you know, this is the mean and the Gauss curvature. It turns out you can write down a, a fairly simple geometric formula for the energy of the vibrating plate that tells you exactly where these lines of sand should be. Uh, you know, there's a sad end to her story. She, her work ended up getting plagiarized by Poisson, and he ended up stealing a lot of the credit for the mathematics. Although she still did get to, uh, she did win the kilogram of gold. So at least she got that. Um, but this same equation turns out to describe a whole bunch of other phenomena related to 2D physics. So it describes the motion of cloth, which is behind uh, some of the simulations I've done of cloth. It also describes the shape of like uh, soap films 
Um, if you have, go to the science museum and dunk uh, wires into soap film and see the shape that you get, uh, that's all explained by the same equations. Even things like the bubbles that appear in like a beer or, or soda or the crumpling patterns of paper, all of this is explained by the same kind of mathematics. And that's behind some of, some of the simulations I've done. Um, so here's a simulation I've done of cloth. Um, and you know, there's interesting wrinkling happening here. And there's also really tough physics of collisions happening here where the, um, uh, I don't know what's going on. Uh, where the cloth is like spinning and uh, getting tighter and tighter and getting more and more packed together. And some of the research I've done has been to uh, make sure that the collisions are resolved correctly. Uh, so that you could, um, you know, cut through the knot that's forming up here and you don't have any penetrations between the different layers of cloth. You still get um, that the cloth is kind of all layered together like a, a pastry. And you can see it's chunky. This is made out of triangles. And if you look closely, you can see the triangles here inside uh, the results but at least there's no penetrations between the different layers of cloth. Okay, so it's nine o'clock. So I'm gonna go ahead and end here. Um, I've done other stuff. I've done, uh, you know, um, simulations of, you know, crumpling, simulations of uh, swelling, of uh, plant morphogenesis, this kind of stuff, uh, which I'm not gonna talk about here. Um, but, uh, you know, I wanna thank you so much for, for your time, uh, for paying attention to the talk and if you have questions about any of the stuff I've talked about or graphics in general uh, or applications of computer graphics or directions the field's going in or anything like that, uh, I'll be happy to take questions. All righty. Uh, yeah, if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the live chat anytime in the next few minutes. Um, we did have one question about your um, use of graphics and uh, the hair simulations in Lord of the Rings, but I think you actually got around to that and answered it a little bit later. Oh, okay, sure, sure. Um, so yeah, really quickly, we'll wait a few minutes for any questions. And if not, then we can call it a night. Okay, here's, here's one. Um, somebody asked, what kind of resources would you recommend to learn more about computer graphics for beginners? Yeah, okay, that's a great question. So um, there's definitely a whole bunch of resources on YouTube that will help you learn computer graphics. So there's uh, lectures of courses that you can look at. So yeah, for example, I've got a friend, Justin Solomon at MIT who teaches the intro computer graphics class there. And I know for a fact that his lectures are videotaped and are all up on YouTube. So you can look at those if you want like a more like a classroom setting uh, um, walkthrough of computer graphics. Um, there's also um, you know, more specialized topics, tutorials on those that take place at SIGGRAPH every year. So SIGGRAPH is the big conference uh, for computer graphics that takes place every uh, summer. And they have a, SIGGRAPH has a YouTube channel and there's a whole bunch of videos they've uploaded there from the last few years. Some of it is spam, right? Some of it's just like marketing crap. Just ignore that stuff. But there's also like, I think it's called university or, or I don't know, courses or something. There's a whole like playlist of um, recordings of professors and industry insiders who have given like one hour tutorials on special topics. Uh, there's also a whole bunch of talks from industry people like, oh, here's how we did the special effects and uh, you know, the movie that came out last summer or whatever, right? And they'll go in depth, they'll do a breakdown of how they've done special effects. So you can find that there too. And there's dozens of these videos. Um, so, you know, it takes a bit of digging to dig through the marketing stuff on, on that channel, but it's really rich in um, uh, tutorials. So um, depending on what your interests are, um, I, I highly recommend you take a look at that as a starting point. Um, and of course, if you're interested in research, uh, there's research papers that are presented at SIGGRAPH too. Uh, there's something called the Technical Papers Fast Forward, uh, which is like a 30 second intro to a bunch of different research papers. And uh, you can find that there. And um, uh, oftentimes researchers will also post talks about their work uh, on YouTube that you can find uh, if you want a more in-depth uh, uh, overview of that. Um, so that can get you started. Uh, of course, uh, I teach computer graphics. If you're a UT Austin student, I'd be happy to have you in my class. 
Um, and I'm happy also to, you know, um, mentor you if you want to do some research projects on computer graphics, just let me know. Cool, 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 cool. I, I think that was it. Nobody asked a question during that time, so we can probably work all, we're probably good. Um, if you awesome. have any questions afterwards, please feel free to message uh, myself or one of the other organizers and we'd be happy to ask Dr. Bruga on your behalf. Um, thank you all for coming today and have a great night. Awesome, thank you.